Good evening and welcome to Sheridan Music Studio. I'm Susan Mertinger and I'm here today with my co-host Svetlana Belsky and we have a special guest today Ilya Levinson. Hello. <laughs> um, Ilya is a Grammy nominated composer and he's a professor of composition at Columbia College and the reason he's here today is that our topic for this evening is contemporary music. And we thought, what better way to discuss contemporary music and reflect on it and share different perspectives than, in to, than to invite one of Chicago's most beloved composers. So thank, thank you for you. being here, Ilya. My pleasure. Thank great you. Great to be you and yes, great it, it's, company. Yes, it's wonderful. Um, so tonight, with this topic of contemporary music, First, I think we should define what is contemporary music. Mm -hmm. And I know from my, from my perspective as a piano competitor and as a teacher of students who compete, very often the requirements are for a piece that is composed after 1950 or 1965. I don't know why that date is so important necessarily uh, because well, I consider I can... all of the 20th century to a certain extent contemporary, mm. but should we limit it to even more recent well, than that? I think so. I know from my students, uh, many of them think that music ended with Debussy, with the possible exception of the Prokofiev Seventh Sonata. That's acceptable and nothing else is, and they have to be dragged into playing anything written afterwards, or that's a little bit modernistic or interesting or non-romantic in sound. Mm -hmm. They have to be dragged and kicking and screaming. So if a competition pro accomplishes that, that's not a bad thing. But I think uh, we need to exclude Rachmaninoff from the list right. because we're not accomplishing the purpose. Yes. Right. yes. But it's, it's interesting, it's probably, um, I, when I was working here, I was thinking we live in 21st century and it's 2020 if we compare what did happen in 1920. <laughs> and would our time be remembered as the Roaring Twenties of uh, 20th century? Yeah, let's hope yeah. so. <laughs> um, so my, my suggestion is that we consider contemporary music the music of our contemporaries, living composers, and everything else that once a composer has passed, it might be considered modern, or just 20th, it's by, termed by its 20, 20th century, or by the particular genre that it occupies within the 20th century. Right, uh, but um, to some extent, if we listen to uh, Charles Ives' pieces, mm -hmm. they sound like they could be written yesterday. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so it's kind of contemporary and definition is stretched. Yeah. <laughs> Some of his music, I feel like, is um, was way ahead of its time. Oh, absolutely. You absolutely. know, of course, I played the Rite of Spring, and everybody says, "Oh, when was that written? Was that last year?" Uh, right. It's more than a hundred years old. <laughs> <laughs> right. So right. all of a sudden, it's it's kind of ironic that things that we consider contemporary or modern are really antiques already, and they've joined the canon of traditional mm -hmm. classical music. So um, for tonight, um, let's talk about these different uh, genres of contemporary music and what we're seeing now in the 21st century. What's, what's popular out there, and who do you like? And uh, we love Ilya's music. We do. Um, but what, what are we seeing that out there now? I think it's a great variety of styles, great variety of wonderful pieces are written every day. And I think at this point, composers can go back as far as they want. They can go to 13th century and adopt the technique of early polyphonic composers. So they can go and write something in the style of Bach and a Baroque style or classical style or uh, 12 tone technique, serial, uh, romantic, neo romantic, uh, using folk idioms. So there's a great variety of um, styles and aesthetics that composers can uh, take inspiration from. So, um I was about to say that, that that's wonderful for us performers because no matter what we personally favor, we can find something. I think we should start with saying, with discussing why it's so important 
to play, uh, for us performers, to play something that's being written right now. It's so easy for our art to become ossified right. and dead. Um, and it's, it's an honor and a responsibility to play things by living composers. Um, it's very frightening. I always feel, well I, recorded, well, I recorded a piece by, let's say, by Marta Ptoszynska on my last CD. Right. Um, it's a short piece and th there's no extended techniques. It's, it's really kind of fascinating harmonically and it's all about exploring the sound of the piano. I loved playing it, but I lived in fear because I never played it for her beforehand and I, I really hoped that she would approve. <laughs> Well, uh, it's, it's impossible, I think, for composers just to keep control of the pieces and attend every performance and uh, provide a critique for the performer. It's, you know, pieces written and, uh, you know, child goes into the world and grows whatever way he or she can. I think that you, you touched on the, the, the one element of performing contemporary music for me, that, that makes it more difficult than playing traditional uh, old repertoire where the composers are no longer living. When you have the composers present, you feel, I think, an even greater responsibility mm -hmm. because they are alive, because their ears are there, because there's a huge responsibility to the composer to make sure that we are doing our job as performers to represent that composer really well. Our performance of the music of living composers can make or break the composer's career too, to a certain sure. extent. Yeah. You know, a, a great mm -hmm. piece is always a great piece and it, it's hard to ruin a great piece. But when you're, when you're a composer, I imagine there is that sort of, um, that, that searching for the ultimate rendition, the ultimate interpretation and delivery of your well, work. As, as a composer, we have also great responsibility because we need to produce a piece that would stay on its own and would say something. And I think no composer wants to give to performer a like half composed piece. <laughs> So this is, I mean, it it's, has, a it's, for yeah, you yeah, it's it's a fear, yes. fear of deadline, and uh, you know, it's 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 terrifying. Yeah, I'm sure. I remember um, Ilya a um, couple of years ago when we formed Pianissimo, Svetlana and I, and two of our colleagues, uh, Yelena Dobovitskaya and Irina Fiaktistova, we formed a four piano ensemble, and there's very little music out there for four pianos. So what did we do? We raised money and we commissioned some of our favorite composers, and you were one of them. Yes, I was. And I remember something you told me, and when I asked you, I, I approached you, and you said, oh, I have a great idea. It was as if when I gave you this, uh, this notion of writing for four pianos, it like leapt into your head. It jumped in, like you had been, something had been brewing in you that you just wanted to jump at this chance. Yes, usually, it happens when someone approaches me for a piece. I usually have great ideas this very moment, but after I ask myself, oh my goodness, what I am getting into? I, <laughs> <laughs> I need to write a piece and now the world will disappear because it will, I mean, really, if you compose a piece, it's all consuming fire. Mm -hmm. Once you experienced it, you want to experience more and it's very hard to get into this mood when you feel, okay, it's a flow, the piece is happening, but there is a life outside, you have life obligations. So it's... It, Do you it's, find it difficult sometimes to tear yourself away well, from the piece? Like it, it sort of consumes you a little ab bit? Ab absolutely, and sometimes mm -hmm. I try to delay to the mm -hmm. very possible moment this time when I go 100% into, because mm -hmm. it's great if, if, if I can spend three months just composing, but unfortunately it's not possible. You have students, yeah, you have a right. wife, you have like kids, a family, yeah, you have right, things, right, you, have, right. so you don't want to be... I have a question. Uh, I wonder what it's like for a composer since you actually knew all four of us. In fact, like, well, you know our styles, right. you know our strengths, our weaknesses. Um, is it different? Is it easier or harder to write for people you know? Uh, no, I, I knew that 
you are all piano virtuosos, so I did not have any uh, limitations. I, yes, I knew that know, whatever, whatever <laughs> I write yes, yes. will be played. On the other hand, I think, Ilya, what, what I love about your pieces, your rep the, the pieces that you have composed for us, and anything that includes piano, is, is with that idea that you are a pianist yourself and a right, very right. fine pianist. And because of that, I, I think that composers who were themselves in history, mm -hmm. over history, yeah, yeah. those that were wrote, those that wrote the best music, the most idiomatic music for a particular instrument, whether it's piano mm -hmm. or viola or violin or trombone, it doesn't matter, that they played those instruments themselves and were uh, not just even proficient, but really quite exceptionally right. good. Or they had instrument. good friends who played those instruments, yes. as we know with the Brahms and Tchaikovsky, right. yeah, with right. the yes. violin concertos. Of course. Yeah. I think of it course. makes a difference, it, because more than absolutely. once I've gotten a piece from a composer that's not a geometric for the piano, may not be playable uh, in the form that it is, or is written for somebody with six fingers, or is written for somebody with three hands. Uh, or it's just written for a computer. <laughs> well, yes. Midi is a friend and a really great enemy. And the destruction. Yes, yes, destruction. Yes, absolutely. Great destruction. It will play anything. I've, uh, I've had a piece written for my earlier piano duo that it sounded great in Midi. We sat down and played it. We couldn't handle the rhythms. They were so intricate and yeah. they involved so much syncopation and the way the human ear works. We couldn't work them in. The tempo could not be what the MIDI played it. Though, just to say that Beethoven wrote low F for violin once. <laughs> so, okay. And he said, I don't care about your violin. This is what I was so basically he, just he, right I didn't know that he Beethoven did that? Once. Yeah. Oh, once. Wow. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. Um, well, you know, also, since instruments evolve, um, sometimes as performers, we can sometimes make modifications in the case of Beethoven's uh, music that, you know, if the piano ended at an F and that sometimes he would reshape the top of the, the line mm -hmm. to accommodate, you right. know, just to fit into the piano keyboard yeah, that can, he had. We and now we can, right. now when, when we have a, a, a recapitulation and it might need to go higher, we can kind of rewrite it if we want to, if we're not purists. Just to say one more thing about Beethoven, when he wrote his first symphony, the woodwind parts were considered unplayable because they were very difficult. And mm -hmm. Tchaikovsky actually wrote high E for oboe. And the oboist of the Royal uh, Imperial Orchestra say, I, I cannot play this note, it's too high. <laughs> so that's, uh, you know. Traditional. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I guess um, winds have been in flux for some time. The piano right. hasn't changed in 120 years. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much. Right. So Though it's changing now, there's a fourth pedal. Yes. Oh, yes. 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 Yeah, yes. Which, which has wonderful effect. Mm. I could spend all my time just playing this chord and hearing the resonance. Oh, you're talking on the, on the Fazioli? Fazioli. Uh, yeah. Fazioli has... Uh, I not, you know, piano. at the NAM festival, the NAM show in Anaheim, I tried a Steingraber piano and it had a lever on it that can adjust the height of the piano, the dip of the piano really? keys to oh. make it make it feel really? like Mozart or Beethoven's piano. Oh, piano and I tried the glissando, wonderful. the octave glissandi and the Volkstein. It. it was yes. such a pleasure, wow. it was so easy. But you know, piano manufacturers um, are coming up with all of these uh, new and novel uh, technologies yeah. and things that they can add to the piano to make it better. Uh, Steinway, this is Steinway Sundays, so I want to make a plug mm. about Steinway. Steinway has the Spirio now, which is really an incomparable um, piano recording and reproduction system. Mm. And I think that um, for anyone, let's say a, a composer especially, the ability to turn this on using an, your iPad, you control it, and record your improvisations. Yeah. Imagine how great it is so that you don't have to take the time to write it down or get mm -hmm. it into the computer or anything. It can be kind of it can be preserved yeah. instantly um, in in a different way than a, a MIDI compatible uh, keyboard is because this actually enables you to play it back with an acoustic piano mm -hmm. and hear yeah. you know Yamaha more has sense. grand MIDI piano which is a um, grand piano with that sends MIDI signals mm -hmm. oh, and yeah. uh, Bezendorfer was doing it for a long time there's a computer which can play actually different interpretations. 
of the same piece by Schnabel or Rubinstein. Oh, and, how and, is it? and yes, yeah, it, it's happened in, I, I saw it in 1988 in Moscow. They were demonstrating Bizendorf. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess they stopped doing it. So uh, let me pose the question. Where, uh, Ilya, you said that now pretty much anything goes because we can look to the past to incorporate all these different genres and right. styles and schools of composition mm -hmm. that have developed. Um, but where do you see the future? Is there anything new left to be said? Is it, do you feel that composition that there's such an infinite amount of sounds and arrangements of notes that we can avoid having things sound the same as what came before or our peers or you know as a composer well, as, as, as in how do we how do how do you maintain your own individual voice and avoid um, being derivative of other composers no um, i think Similarities are inevitable. Yes, of course, of course. But I, I work on a piece, and if I like it with all my heart, it means that other people also will like mm -hmm. it. And I don't really think about the style. Mm -hmm. I just use whatever uh, techniques I have in my domain. And references in contemporary music are inevitable. And I think for performer, it's important to uncover those references. Mm -hmm. uh, what is probably different in the music of our days is the speed with which the events are happening mm -hmm. in music. Because yeah. look at everything that's happening around us, the advertising, the movies, the way art is presented, the plays, uh, non-linear uh, development mm -hmm. of the piece of art. I think all this finds its place in music and it, it's a performer who can really help composer to uncover what is there because sometimes maybe we put something unconsciously mm -hmm. and uh, but it's there. <laughs> so do you um, also enjoy, we discussed in our previous um, podcast collaboration, as a composer um, what type of collaboration, aside from the performers with whom you collaborate, um, do you enjoy other interdisciplinary co collaborations? Sure, very much. Um, uh, collaboration with the theater, writing music for a, a theatrical play, a musical, mm -hmm. writing music for a film. Uh, I did a lot of work in documentary films. Um, all, all, all this is very satisfying because one plus one is five. five. Yeah, yeah. It's all yeah. The, the energies, the synergy is much greater than the parts. As Wagner discovered yeah. some time ago. Yeah. Do you find that, that, that the collaboration uh, with other media, that that gives you even greater inspiration? Or do you feel that either way, whether you're doing absolute music or whether you're doing programmatic music, it doesn't matter, you feel a certain... Well, musical inspiration, regardless. If what? you are doing a project with someone, you have deadline. Yeah. And I think for composers, it's a blessing and a curse because <laughs> if there won't be any deadline, I might like spend my time writing <laughs> one piece for several <laughs> years and never really finish yeah. it. But yeah. if I have a deadline, yeah. I need to finish this piece and I start working on other. So I think it's important being composer in the society. And also uh, responding to the needs of the society, uh, mm -hmm. reflecting in the music, what is happening in the world, the crisis in, in the world, the famine and mm -hmm. uh, once your deadline, Once your deadline is passed though, and it's already your piece has received its premiere and it's already taken flight. You've revisited several pieces and yes. you've reworked them and yes. you've reorchestrated the, them. The, this is the most right? difficult thing because you cannot be yourself three years ago. I mean, once I needed to write another movement to a piece that I composed you know, five or six years ago, that was the most difficult thing oh, because sure. my style have changed and I just need to go back in time and really understand what I can do and what I cannot do. <laughs> so that, that's very challenging. Oh, so but each movement will have its own personality and its own Yes, sound. well, uh, 
you have three movements in the same mood and fourth one, which is completely different. That's kind of <laughs> well, I know, for sugar. example, um, sugar, yeah. the shtetl scenes, yeah. which is on my new CD, American yeah. Melting Pot, that has seen many forms. Yes. And, um, and I love every single form. And I, uh, you know, you first gave it to me as a solo piano piece. Right. But I love the fact when I approached you, I said, you know, I'm doing a chamber music concert. Would you orchestrate this? Would you score this for a chamber ensemble? And you jumped at the opportunity to do that. And I took, it, it gave the piece a whole new life. Mm -hmm. yes. I think it yes. breathed a new life yes. into it. And then you went on and, and orchestrated it for the Chicago Sinfonietta. Yes, so this right. piece first was orchestrated for chamber orchestra, after for piano trio, and after mm -hmm. for a large symphony orchestra, and after for uh, actually duo. Yeah. Violin yeah. and piano. Oh, you did a duo yeah. version? I'm also still waiting for the wow. two piano versions. Oh, yes. Okay, okay. okay. Maybe yeah. we should make it into a four, yeah, we could do a two or four piano version, or, or two piano, <laughs> eight hand version. Um, well, for those of you who are, who, 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 regular for piece. those of you who, whose uh, curiosity is piqued, um, the shtetl scenes is a five movement work, and it is just, I think, an absolutely, absolutely stunning, gorgeous beautiful piece. piece. And you can hear it on my new American Melting Pot CD, and it's in a live performance. Um, and I'm very much, I'm so grateful for the work because I also did perform it recently in a piano quartet version and yeah. you added some things to right. it, yeah. um, which are actually not on the CD performance, but um, I, I love what you added. And every time I play it, I, I feel like, well, it's, you know what the sign of a great piece is, is that you never get tired of it. Thank so. you, thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. You never get tired of practicing it, and I never get tired of performing it. So I hope I have many more Thank opportunities you. to do so, Ilya. Yeah, uh, me too, I hope. <laughs> yes. And what a lovely job my duo will do. Um, when such a moment comes. I'm, I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to um, perhaps talk about um, the a little more specifics about the technology of Sibelius or Finale or whatever yeah. you use and Finale, how that, use you use Finale, yeah. how has that, because clearly that hasn't been around your whole life of composition, your whole career. It was around since I came here, I used oh, to this Finale oh, version, okay. Finale 1, this okay. is when I started to use yeah. it, uh, in 89. Oh wow! So that's no, uh, or or ninety mm -hmm. in nineteen nine it was professional composer and it become finale version one. Yeah. So it's almost thirty years now yeah. that you've been yeah. using it. Does it does it seem like um, you could never go back to paper and pencil? No, uh, or do you stop? No, to, like, I, I, I think I think it's very pencil. comforting to use paper and pencil, and I do my all my sketches, initial sketches, mm -hmm. just in a two liner on a paper and pencil. Unless I don't have time, and in this case, I use, I type notes directly in the computer, but again, I am typing it, it's not computer, please. Mm -hmm. Though there are some uh, like canonic utilities in Finale that can do inversion and mm -hmm. retrograde, which, which is, I mean, not hard, not uh, hard to do mm -hmm. on the paper, but they could do it like, quickly. Yeah, yeah, with a transposition. Yeah. Nice and guy. you can also transpose yeah. things. Right, yeah, this, this is very helpful. Yes. Yes. Absolutely, this is very know, convenient. A few years ago, so, quite some years ago, I performed a piece by Augusta B. Thomas, wonderful piece, The Top Serenade, and um, I met with her and the violinist David Yonin, who's also a good friend of yours as well, yeah. and we met with, um, we met with the Augusta and um, she, you know, her studio, her piano was covered with paper scores, you know, manuscript paper. And she said she really still loves that. I don't know if yeah. it's changed for her, um, but it's the same way that I feel sometimes, like I can read a book on a Kindle, but there's something really nice about having the book in my hand. Yeah. And, and get over it. Um, <laughs> we performers, however, highly appreciate not having a manuscript copy. That's um, true. We're not used to reading them anymore. I, I'm yeah. sure in box time you could read... It's like chicken scrawl from the, in the, the, the old absolutely. manuscripts. Absolutely. And um, every time I'm handed one, I'm in despair because I can't read it. I can't see it. I have to literally color the notes in. Right. Um, 
the page turns are never in the right place. You cannot do anything with it. So well, I would like to beg all composers out there, if you want to play your stuff, uh, finale, please. Yeah. With, with page turns. Composing yeah. on a piece of paper has really very beneficial effects. You cannot check your email on a piece of paper. Yes. You cannot <laughs> check <laughs> Facebook or watch YouTube video. It's just a piece of paper where you yeah, and you and you. Right. And you but you after you're done, notes. though. After you're done, you go for a walk. Before you hand it to us. Yeah. yeah. Now, oh, yes, that's, that's true. Svetlana, I would like you to take the lead on this next topic question because you just finished performing a big piece by John Cage on seven Absolutely. harps supports. I mean, yes. you only played one of the right. harps supports, but uh, yes. um, tell us a little bit right. about that because I, want, I think now mm -hmm. I'd like to go into how, as performers, we approach the score and what are the things that we that a person needs to do to play contemporary music where there might not be a recording of it where um, or you may never have heard it in a performance so it might be a premiere it might not be mm -hmm. But please elaborate right. on so your recent experience. This was not only not a premiere, it was a 50th anniversary celebration. Um, uh, the piece is amazing. It is a multimedia work. There What's are, the name of it? Uh, it's called Harpsichord. Harpsichord. Well, it, it's spelled in a Hebrew fashion without any uh, vowels. Oh. So it's... Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, that there are uh, screens that show videos. Um, original videos were all about outer space. This time, um, there was some out of space and a great deal of uh, Chicago neighborhoods. There are 51 tape channels also playing things. Uh, in this performance, oh people, the, the, the audience could, by just uh, uh, putting a QR code into their phones, choose one of the channels and transmit that as well. And the harpsichords are sp uh, spread out and all doing their own thing. In the um, same room. In the same well, in the same room. So there is uh, quite a bit of uh, th there's a very profound aleatorial quality. So uh, it's completely chance. Each of the harpsichordists plays their thing, and then they maybe play bits of their thing, or they play some Mozart, or they play their neighbor's things. Nobody played my thing because I happen to be stuck with the absolute hardest part. But hardest also means fascinating. So. Uh, as I was studying, I was given exactly zero instructions, just the manuscript in, in a pretty bad handwriting. And did it contain the other harpsichord parts? No, it did, no, it did your, not. You were only given your part? Only my part, because oh. we, we don't even hear each other, not really. Oh. Um, so the first thing that I noticed, it was very long, and the first ten pages were very pretty and very sight-readable, and then things began to happen, and by the time I got to page 20, I was holding onto my head and trying to figure out how do I cancel, which apparently exactly the same thing happened in the premiere, the person who played my part did in fact back out and somebody else had to take the part oh because of the incredible complications. Right around page 30, um, it's, it's about ripping one's hair out. The rhythms are impossible and uh, have to be literally calculated. I, I was drawing lines as to what goes with what. Then I began to notice that there were quotes in the music and as it turned out, uh, the, the person who played my part originally was in fact there, the person who ended up playing it in the premiere, and he showed me some more things that I missed. But what the part does is it goes through every 25 years of music starting with Mozart and includes a mm -hmm. quote. So in the beginning, uh, around starting around page 12, my left hand goes dee da dum dum da dum dum dum. So there's oh. a quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of that, and then I recognized there was a little bit of Chopin left hand going on, and then I recognized quite shockingly all kinds of quotes from Busoni Sonatina Seconda and Dr. Faustus did the, his opera, and I thought, okay, well that's weird because who besides me actually knows Busoni? As it yeah. turns out, of course, John Cage was. a fan, and the only reason I recognize it is because suddenly some parts were not difficult for me to learn, so here's a measure with seven notes in it where I'm going crazy not understanding the rhythm, and here's a measure with 16th notes just spilling out of it and my hand just plays it. It's because I just finished recording the Sonatina Seconda. <laughs> um, uh, it has, I mean, truly difficult runs of, um, you know, seconds, chromatic and otherwise going up in one oh. hand, and I'm just playing them. 
Uh, so that was fun. Uh, it turns out I missed um, references to pieces that I didn't know, like a God Talk piece. Mm -hmm. Um, and a piece by Cage himself, and hilariously, I missed references to uh, Schumann's Carnival, which I do play. So that was funny. <laughs> that I completely, I completely missed those. Well, why do you think you missed it? Was it the way that it was presented? Was well, it yes. buried in a lot of other oh, notes? Yes, 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 like, yes. Completely. So everything, everything is overlapped. So if my right hand is doing a little bit of reconnaissance from um, from Carnival, my left hand is doing simultaneously a left hand from a Chopin prelude and uh, some uh, horrifying jumps from Gottschalk, which I, as I said, I did not recognize, all in 13 with dots and rests um, and internal triplets, um, which to me just basically eventually meant play unevenly, which I think that, that must have been the intent. I, I came to listen to this piece yesterday, and I actually enjoy it very much. And uh, for me, uh, Cage's pieces is just a time span where you come and you think about things, and you, the sounds, and it's not mu music in a concert hall what we usually uh, used to, but it's a time space for one to think about sounds around you. Uh, life universe and yes. everything. Yeah, was the, was there, video, was yes. there a compete, what, did the different harpsichords compete with mm -hmm. each other for you your could, attention? We couldn't really even hear each yeah. other. As people yeah. walked around... Yeah. They if you come close, you can hear mm -hmm. it, and oh. you go and you hear so the sounds. It wasn't they weren't designed no. to really... Oh, no, not at no. all. It's completely no. aleatoric. No. Um, some of the audience members would come up and, and speak to me, and I had a really lovely conversation with one gentleman. And, Did uh, you stop to speak to them? Or like you were allowed to do yeah. that? Yes, we well we had to. Nobody can play for three hours. So. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so you could start and stop whenever uh, you felt like. Absolutely, it. I well. have my favorite bits from the piece, and I played those a lot more than I played my less favorite bits. Um, um, I played a little Mozart. It's Chopin's birthday today. Happy birthday, Frederick. Yes. Uh, I played a little Chopin while I was at it. Why not? Yeah. But anyways, the conversation that I had with the gentleman, he had a very interesting uh, perspective on all this. Um, he said when he came in, he didn't know what to expect and what he came up with. And I totally agree with him. It's a time to drop your preconceptions, all preconceptions, absolutely, absolutely. and just be. And just yeah. let all of this, uh, it's almost an overwhelming sensual experience. It's, it's just let it go through you. Let it have whatever effect it chooses to have. Mm -hmm. You can walk to a different part of the room where you can hear a different, um, different audio because there are 51 audio channels going at once. Yeah. Some have musical sounds, some have honking. The, the one next to me was honking. Um, it still scared me by the end of the second day. Uh, I, li I like those sounds. Let me ask you a question. How different was the first day versus the second day? And what do you think ah, but changed? By the second day, by the second day I changed? already had the conversation where I learned to recognize all the quotes in my music. So I was being much more careful about l really framing them and really hearing them. I got lots of compliments the second day from people who know the part. It sort of frightened me because the part is unbelievably difficult, which they admitted. May <laughs> maybe this is what contemporary music is, that it's references you need to recognize where it was Cage was telling us right? the message. But, but think about the students who already did this. When was Porcinella? Mm. Uh, was it 1901? The composer's always doing it. Well, well absolutely. Yeah. Of course, of course. And there's absolutely nothing Debussy wrong Debussy did it and, you know, absolutely. he quoted Wagner and... Well, um, it was a different purpose. Different, <laughs> yes, of course. There's satire right. and there's right. satirical quotes yeah. and... Uh, uh, I'm not convinced how serious Cage's intent was either. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because uh, here's my left hand doing uh, Appassionata in F. Then he's doing G-flat. And then the right hand's doing little bits in all kinds of random keys. So it's and kind with of a polytonal, yeah. atonal, it's, polytonal, it's completely recognizable polyrhythmic, yeah. tonal craziness. Absolutely. And that's why we Did you feel that it times, was music? Times. Everything is music. Silence is music. The car honking is music. Um, it's just what this music is supposed to, what, what effect the music is supposed to have on you. And that's, I would like to actually have, do a little tirade right now. If, if you don't okay. mind. So music has to affect you on, on, on some level, whether that level is uh, emotional or intellectual or purely sensual. Um, that's, that depends on the composer, but it has to affect you on some level. So I find the music that I enjoy playing from any period at all has to affect me in some way. 
um, music that leaves me completely cold, I will not waste my time on. We have, we as pianists, we have much more repertoire than we will ever touch. Uh, I find a lot of contemporary pieces, uh, pieces written by friends, uh, pieces given to me by composers, I don't know, end up affecting me on some level that I didn't expect. Uh, for example, I will find a, a hidden structure in it that wasn't immediately obvious. Maybe it's still not obvious to the listener, but it's obvious to me, and boy, am I having a good time. Right. Yeah, uh, but I, I disagree. Um, I'm going to be a little bit bold here and say that I don't think everything is music. I think there's noise, and I think there's music. John Cage is a respected composer, so we anticipate that what he's putting together is going to be music. And I expect it was, uh, you know, at least the individual parts. I'm not so sure that I would have enjoyed it because I find it very hard if I'm practicing a piece and I hear someone in the next room practicing another piece and, and, and I find it very difficult to have these um, conflicts in well, my ear. Remember I said you, you know, have to drop your preconceptions. Yeah. Well, yeah. M music was always connected with the numbers and with the proportions from the very beginning mm -hmm. of the music, the music of the spheres. And actually Cage is doing it by uh, introducing a logari um, logarithmic um, progression that processes all the sounds and distributes them to the speakers. Mm -hmm. But we cannot, of course, notice it or follow it, but the calculation is there. Okay, so there, there, was, there was a plan. There was a grand oh, up, up, scheme. Up, up, absolutely, oh, absolutely. There was a beginning, there was a middle, there was an end. Well, well I would not say this, but... That depends on how you perceive it. I mean, there's yeah. an end in that things kind things of thin disappear, out yeah. and disappear. Okay. Like, and there are beginning when they start. <laughs> right. And one of the harpsichords right. kind of misses the cue to stop and right. continues playing, so that becomes right. the end. Right. Yeah, okay. I, you know, I, I'm sorry I missed it. Is it recorded, that uh, performance? I, I have some on my cell phone I can play. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so, um, chunks, yeah. so let me ask, um, Ilya, let me ask you a question. Um, when you compose for different size ensembles, is it like geometrically harder, the, more num the, the greater the number of, perform of, of instruments that you're writing for? Mm. In other words, I mean, like a four piano ensemble is has to be a lot more work in a sense than just doing a solo piano piece. True. How how much more work um, is it to compose for a full symphony orchestra than for a string quartet, or is it the same? Or, or did both demand um, because of the economy of a string quartet? Do both genres, both ensembles? demand the same amount of attention and well, time. Well, there is a composition and there is a production. To produce a piece for symphony orchestra with the parts and the score, that's enormous amount of time. Yes. Writing a piece for string quartet probably is the most difficult thing because of the pre-existing repertoire, which as a composer I need to know and see what can I contribute to this ocean of great pieces. Mm -hmm. Uh, with the orchestra, you know, you can play with timbres, and you can, uh, I, I would say there's a more possibilities. Well, in, with the string quartet, I mean, strings also have enormous variety of timbres and articulations. Mm -hmm. I would say writing music is hard, <laughs> yeah. no matter what. I'm sure it is, <laughs> no doubt. Is it, is it for one instrument, or for string quartet, or for orchestra? It just, you know, one instrument, it, it's because we, we composers now produce music, so for mm -hmm. one instrument it's easier to produce, and for ensemble you need to produce parts. Doesn't Finale do it? Finale would do it, but there's a lot of adjustments and, mm -hmm. and, and making, making sure things look right, and this is where time goes. Mm. So, um, let me ask you another question regarding commissions. Um, you said one of the big things is having a deadline. Um, do you also just write music sometimes because the spirit moves you to do so and there's no deadline but you're just um, sort of, you know, keeping your, uh, uh, you, you just feel a absolutely. certain inspiration that absolutely. just... Absolutely. I, yes. I have a, a pile of papers with ideas uh -huh. and uh, periodically I 
take the pile and put it in a box and I say, where the many piles are already so and I see oh that's a great idea do I have time to develop it <laughs> um, so what um, do you think about the makeup of concerts should it be should we do you think contemporary music should be um, surrounded by other contemporary music or should be, should be worked into a program with historically traditional classical repertoire so that we see some sort of relationship to that? Um, which do you think showcases your music best? Well, personally, I like very much uh, the model of Grand Park where every concert includes contemporary piece uh, um, with uh, classics. Mm -hmm. um, the concerts of purely contemporary music seems to have less audience, though, like if you go to Constellation and mm -hmm. they almost full houses for the performances mm -hmm. of contemporary music, it's hard to say. But that, yeah. doesn't that make contemporary or newly written works um, seem like they're their own little ghetto and, th and they're not yeah. part of the yes. flow of music? Yeah, so okay. I, I, I would... Uh, I would advocate that uh, contemporary pieces would be included in the program with uh, 19th century or but as you said there are certain contemporary ensembles that specialize, specialize only yeah, yeah. in contemporary music yeah. so but I, I suspect that an audience that's going to go hear that ensemble goes there with that full knowledge and that eagerness and excitement mm -hmm. to hear but the new it, music and again, now we are talking what is contemporary. For example, if uh, the true. ensemble performs piece by Varese, that's many? that's written yeah. hundred years ago. Yes, that's but true. it still sounds great. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's that's absolutely true. Right, um, the year of production doesn't doesn't tell you anything about right. the style. You can play yeah. something written in the last ten years, which sounds like Brahms. Yeah. Well, you some know, of the most modernistic pieces are in a period that I love so much between, let's say, 1910 to 1930, where some of the most incredible music was written. Groundbreaking. Up. Absolutely, where yeah. every piece is revolutionary. Abs absolutely. You know what? And I sounds am. revolutionary. Yes. And so this Buzoni. Day, Buzoni was My guy Buzoni is amazing. Mm -hmm. Schoenberg yeah. is amazing. Stravinsky yeah. is amazing. Yes. Griffiths is amazing. Yes. Ravel is amazing. Yeah. But you know, uh, in when I, as I'm, I'm preparing now to play Beethoven Emperor Piano Concerto, and more than ever um, in studying the works of Beethoven, um, you know when we think of contemporary music, I think that the general public thinks it's dissonance, that it, it that the main uh, element in the harmony is dissonance, and that that's what separates it from romantic music or baroque music. Well, when I Next play Bach, music is when so I play dissonant. Bach, yes. some of it sounds so yeah. dissonant to me. Oh, and same mean. thing with Beethoven. Tremendous dissonances. Um, you hear these most unusual dissonances also in the works of Chopin. I think he well, was so he far went ahead of his time. He by the end there. Exactly. Yeah. It's like yeah. so crazy. Least. Oh my goodness. And yeah. so what I've also discovered is that the works of contemporary composers are now or maybe not just now, but equally so, embracing consonants. In other words, there are composers who are contemporaries who are not out there to just write something dissonant just so that it falls into this sort of contemporary um, genre and so that it's perceived to be modern. Um, it, it, it's an interesting question, and uh, actually at Columbia College we will have a discussion with the philosophy professor what would be value of a work if someone would write a fugue in a Bach style, like exactly what would be aesthetic value of hmm. this work? I've had that conversation with students yeah. who compose, let's say, in, in the style of Beethoven. Yeah. And my point to this is, well, Beethoven wrote great music. Yes. Are you better than Beethoven? Um, then Hard to... <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. I think the answer to that is pretty much understood. And that, where is your own voice? It's, I think it's very important to learn how to oh. write in the start. Well, that's the idea of like model composition. Mm -hmm. That's the idea of an artist who is going to do a copy of a Renoir or a Degas or a Monet. Right. So they learn exactly. a style and they, mm -hmm. they are, by doing so, they're 
you know, they're sharpening their artistic skills. Right. They're getting the their same jobs. thing. Right. The same thing for a composer. Right. You had it, to do model composition. Yeah. I did it when I was in mm. school studying. And it's, um, yeah, it's interesting what's happened with Rimsky Korsakov after he wrote his first operas and become a very popular composer in Russia. He stopped composing and he started writing. Uh, fugues in the style of Bach using Russian folk songs. Mm -hmm. And I went to the Moscow Conservatory Library and I looked at those fugues and they are like modeled Bach uh, E flat minor or uh -huh. uh, A minor, but there is a Russian folk tune. A folk really? Yeah, so, uh, but what he did it and he acquired this polyphonic technique and easy and, and he become more. Uh, technically uh, proficient and he returned to composition. So that's happened. Yeah. Well, let me also add to this that um, I think audiences sometimes react negatively to some of this mo most modernistic music because of how it is played. Abs oh, ab yeah, I agree. Um, I agree. If all I you're agree. hearing is, uh, is the jagged edges, then right. that's what the audience is going to hear. Right. I need to put a little plug in here because um, my, my piano duo re re recorded Petrushka. I mean, how many times has that been done? Right. But um, a review we got, the last review, really touched me because this is by Jeffrey Beagle, who didn't know it was me, even though he's a friend, uh, because he just saw the, the name of the duo. And what he said is what he was impressed with is that we brought out the lyrical aspects instead yeah. of just oh. banging our way through it. Because, I mean... Love story. I, <laughs> it, yeah. it's, it's the most amazingly yes. dramatic piece, um, mm -hmm. and even the banking parts, they all have to dance. Yeah. Uh, so, no, there's no beating of the piano. There's a wild dance, there's a last wild yeah, dance. It's, it's and, a ballet. And, yes, right, right, and then there is somebody who's, whose heart is broken, who is crying, oh, and that's what the whole piece is about. Absolutely. And I've heard exactly the same compliment um, about my performance of The Rite of Spring, because I concentrate on the human elements, uh, which are so yes. amazing in that. The, 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 the human voice, I mm -hmm. think, is, the, the, is present in all instrumental music. And I know that you uh, probably have had the same training where your teachers have said, sing this line and see where it goes. And right. how would you vocalize this? Right. And, and because as a pianist, we're playing essentially a percussive, very percussive instrument, and one of the greatest um, challenges for us is to be able to play legato and to be able to play um, cantabile uh, and make something sing and you know that's I think one of the the biggest challenges is is getting the balance between the hands just so and sometimes the melody might be in the left hand sometimes it might be in the right hand sometimes it might be in both hands or transferring between and to have that kind of technical control to always it's, I don't know if it's technique or if it's just having a good ear. Well, it's because you have to Listen, know Composing what is hard, but playing is also hard. Well, understanding what is written. Right. Yes. There well, is I'm, always a leading voice. Well, let me tell you a funny story about that. I was playing um, with a quartet, and we were just in the car uh, going on tour somewhere, and they were discussing a performance that, that they just had, which was uh, new music by this composer who won some prize. And they were going, look, can you imagine? He just came up to us, the composer, and said, well, we, we didn't realize he wanted a, a warm and beautiful tone. Uh, and my reaction just, what? Huh? Uh, why would you play, uh, unless th there seems to be some kind of indication that he wants something, a, a specific thing, why wouldn't you make your instrument sound good? It's music. Well, there are, so I tried yeah, to bring you know, that. To, but to, there are times when you well, want that well, kind of biting well, sound. Of course you, you, know, you do. In a Prokofiev. Well, or, but even right. in Prokofiev, then, there's all this incredible lyricism. I think it's there's a great deal of lyricism in yeah. all music. Um, even in my jam cage, that there were moments where there were mel melodic uh, fragments. So why not play them as melodic fragments? If you play stuff uh, in a way that shows that you don't like it or don't understand it, how do you expect the audience to react to it? Exactly the way you do. Uh, if you play with love, it sounds loving. Let loving. me ask you, Svetlana, what do you feel? Um, do you, or or Ilya, you can also respond. Um, as far as memorizing contemporary music um, versus using a score. Do you feel that um, it's an imperative to try to memorize contemporary music as we would a sonata of Beethoven or Chopin? 
That would be great. Uh, I went to the performance of Jack Quartet, of the uh, Ninth Quartet of, uh, you know, I forgot the name of the composer, but it was performing in darkness, complete darkness. Oh, mm -hmm. wow. Like, so it they it, was, it was absolutely Oh, my mind goodness. Blowing. Fantastic. Yeah. So they were able to just do mm -hmm. it from memory. Right. That must be that must be hard also if you can't even see your instrument. Yes, yeah, and, and it was. <laughs> well, actually, a lot of uh, a lot of ensembles practice this way. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. I think it's very important if you cannot see each other's visual cues, you have to learn how to breathe together, how to feel each other without seeing. Um, my perception on, on the, uh, my feeling about the memory is, if we require these pieces to be memorized, we're going to cut down the uh, ability of so many people to perform it. And I say anything that limits is a bad thing. That's true. Yeah, yeah. I, I would. The I more would open agree. doors, the better. And now that we have iPads and and page flip pet, foot pedal turners, it, it makes it a, it makes it a lot easier. Absolutely. Um, so, especially as I keep saying, if composers are very careful about how they notate their score and provide page turns, thank you. <laughs> anyway, you um, can see I have pet peeves. I've had experiences. Ilya, do you have anything special that you're currently working on or anything on the horizon that you'd like to tell well, our I, audience I about? just finished the piece on Thursday. Ooh, congratulations. Yes, it's called Impressions. It's for uh, Ensemble EC21, uh, based in South Bend, Indiana. And it's actually based on a um, technique that I discovered when I went to Andy Warhol exhibition. Uh -huh. And it just struck me, this is a great idea for a piece of music. So I was very happy that I could implement his ideas in the piece of music. So, so what is it? Uh, well, it's, uh, so he did a drawing of a Mao. Mm -hmm. And after the Xerox machine would do 300 prints and each print would progressively uh, elongate and increase resolution by 0.1%. So at the beginning, print 1 through 20, you have the full face, and after you start to have lines, so from the object to the abstract lines. Oh, and I wow. thought, wow, this is a great idea for a music piece of music. That, that sounds fabulous. So it will be done in South Bend on April 3rd, and here at Columbia College Chicago on April 22nd. Oh, excellent. Exciting. That is very Looking exciting. forward. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, so in conclusion, as we're talking about contemporary music, is there anything else that either of you want to add about that you feel is important for our audiences to know? Um, well, um, I mean, I we like haven't to, maybe yeah. talked enough about, um, well, we have talked some about how we approach the score. But um, I'd like to share, you know, a little bit about how I approach a score um, that's contemporary. But maybe you want? Do you want to? Well, I want to. I want well, to you've discuss about something game, quite but, completely um, different. Oh, that I would like to quote Isaac Asimov. I had the pleasure of seeing him just about a year before mm -hmm. he died, and people asked him all kinds of questions, and he said something that really stuck with me. He said he was talking about literature, but he said that ninety. 5% or 90% of anything written within a decade is crap and it's going to disappear. But you do not know uh, which, which is the 5% that survives. And so it's important to read everything. Uh, and, and it's the same thing for us. We do not know. Uh, we know historically composers that were um, favored, let's say, over Chopin or Schumann. We've forgotten them. And yet at the time they were all right. the rage. So we have no idea what will survive. So um, we should. I like that notion. I like that notion because it means that everybody who's a composer out there, and composers are still struggling, same as they were in the 18th or 19th century. Nothing's changed. Right? Everyone struggles as a performer, as a composer of classical music. Um, I think that we we have to keep that open mind, and we have to do everything we can to promote each other as performers and composers, Absolutely. Absolutely. and and have that you know, constant collaboration because what we're doing, the, con the music of our times with our colleagues, uh, living composers, is what was done, you know, 150, right. 200 years ago. And we need to be part of that same tradition of exploring things that are new to us. I find that it is a huge growing experience to learn new music. And primarily because um, in talking about 
the process of not composing it, but learning it, we don't have access necessarily um, to a prior performance or recording. Cool. We still just have the score. So we can, you know, if we're playing Chopin or Beethoven or Debussy, there's umpteen recordings we can listen to and get it some ideas. And uh, But when you play something that's totally new and you're the one that's going to premiere it, you are the originator of the interpretation, the first interpretation. It's something really extraordinary that carries with it huge responsibility, yes. but it's also the most creative part of being a performer, is interpretation within, like absolute interpretation of a score with no outside influence from other media or mm -hmm. other performers. The only person that you might consult with would be the composer. Yes. Right. And and perhaps and the other members of your ensemble, if it's an ensemble piece. So I, I think that that's what has um, changed my whole perspective as a performer is embracing contemporary music. When I was younger, I wasn't. I when I was very young, I I had penned in my seven year old handwriting. I always want to be a, I want to be a composer and a pianist for the rest of my life or all my life. That's all I wanted to be. So I knew that I, I, I loved co composing. I loved that when I was a child, and I, I gave it up. I'm very proud of the fact that one of my children is a composer. So I feel like part of that um, passion and love for, for music, composing, that creative um, aspect was passed down to one of my progeny. But when I was then in my formative years in, in my educational training, I was very, um, I, was, I was so steadfast in my belief that I did not want to embrace contemporary music because I felt if people did not appreciate the way I played Beethoven or Bach or Chopin or Mozart or Debussy or Prokofiev even, that, um, that I wasn't going to be a, uh, that I, I wasn't a good enough pianist. I wanted people to appreciate my pianism and my interpretation of the... Oh, but there's no reason not to do so. Exactly. I, I've so always enjoyed I'm, I'm uh, playing that young new pieces. People... I won several awards in fact competition for the uh, for the piece that was written for was, was for the competition because I find there's such a joy in trying to get into the composer's head and trying to understand what's going on there. To me, exactly. I am exactly. working right now. My next CD will be uh, by uh, works by uh, a living composer who sent me his stuff, but, and I'm torturing him right now because. I, it's a manuscript, bless his heart, and I'm finding mistakes, or at least things I think are mistakes. You're not, you're not always sure if they're mistakes. Well, of course. That's what so you my always first, have to... The first five I ask, after he answers that, I'm able to actually kind of guess. But of course, I yeah. still run it by him. But then it's wonderful to understand what yeah. is actually going on in the piece. We're like, yeah, that's really a B flat. I guarantee it's a B flat. <laughs> and then he has to admit that it's a B flat, because I now understand at least something about his compositional... Problem. But you understand she doesn't understand still, the size of my hands, but we'll, we'll, we'll work around that. But what, what I was trying to bring out was that mm -hmm. there was a point in time where pianists who wanted to become famous or make a name for themselves would use contemporary music as a hook. And I felt like that when I was younger, fun. I didn't want to use it as a hook. But now I don't think that it's a hook at all because I think it's absolutely it's music. necessary. Music is music. And, and it's so gratifying. And when I started embracing performing new music, I found that my musicianship changed and my whole approach to every type of score has changed. And, and this is actually some of the most exciting music, learning Absolutely. new music, the most exciting process for me because it really does demand the most of a performer and a composer right. and... Uh, and you feel you feel good about playing, and it creates something. a future it does. for uh, for our art, and that exactly. seems to be like a very good place for us to. Yes, end. as a composer, yes. we greatly appreciate it. Yes, <laughs> well, we are so delighted that we've had this wonderful conversation about contemporary music with our special guest Ilya Levinson. Thank, thank, thank you, you for so joining much. Us. For thank being you, no, here. it was, was great. And great um, Svetlana and, and for our next. Piece. 
Yes. Uh, we so have, we you, have you, you convinced me. Now you convinced me. <laughs> Ilya, all... Ilya has composed for our Pianissimo Ensemble. He has um, dedicated a piece to me. I've also recorded your elegy for violin and right. piano mm -hmm. with David Yonin. And um, there's... You just have... I, and, I, and, and something is coming, I tell you later. Oh, oh I'm so oh, excited. Oh, something's coming. Um, yes. I see. <laughs> yeah, I feel the the sincerest, it. biggest no, 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 compliment no, no, no. that Thank any you. performer can get, ever have is when composers dedicate their works to the performer that they, of their choice. And, you're, and if you're a performer and a work is dedicated to you, it is just unbelievable. Jeremy Beck dedicated four preludes to me. They arrived in the mail completely by surprise. Oh. Aaron Alter dedicated a sonata to me. You've dedicated pieces to me. Unbelievable honor and, and such a joy. It is a gift to have that happen. Um, and I am just, I'm really looking forward to one of my next programs. Um, which is going to be called Four Centuries of Variations, and I will be premiering here in Chicago. Um, it's going to include traditional going back to Handel with harmonious blacksmith variations, and, and then some Beethoven and Schumann symphonic variations, and then a, a number of brand new works that I'm working up by some wonderful composers, Margarita Zelenaya, Judith Shayton, um, George Janopoulos, or Nick Janopoulos, so um, stay tuned for more about that. Anyway, thank you everyone um, for listening and in taking part by listening to our discussion of contemporary music because this is one of the most important um, things that we can do to keep classical music alive True. is to actually support the classical music composers and performers of that music. Thank you. Thank you. And good night. And good night. Good night.